Daniele Prada from uh, Pavia is going to talk about the stabilization of the non-conforming virtual element method. So thanks, Daniele. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Paula, and thank you very much to all the organizers for this kind invitation. Today, I will be talking about uh, um, stability uh, for the non-conforming virtual element method. And this is a joint work in collaboration with uh, Silvia Bertoluzza, Gianmarco Manzini, and Nicole Pennacchio. So, uh, after a super quick introduction, I will be talking about uh, um, a duality technique that we developed for uh, uh, stabilizing non-conforming bank from an abstract viewpoint. Then uh, I will tell you how we uh, apply this strategy to the non-conforming BEM, and finally I will show you some numerical experiments. Okay, so let's get started and uh, I will jump right away into the problem. Just mentioning that we are, uh, since this is uh, like a theoretical investigation, we are in the framework of, uh, of the Poisson problem and uh, uh, in 2D. And uh, I just need to recall the uh, definition of the local non-conforming virtual element space on a polygon of a, of a given grid. So uh, locally, what we, are, uh, what we are given is the normal derivative uh, of a virtual element function, which is a polynomial of degree k minus 1 on each edge. And the uh, uh, Laplacian of this virtual function is a polynomial of degree k minus 2. On this space, where a possible unisolvent set of degrees of freedom is, uh, is the following, where we have the moments of a virtual function b on, uh, uh, on each edge tested against the polynomials uh, of degree k minus 1 on the edge and k minus 2 inside the uh, element. I have to say that we can take any kind of polynomial basis both on the edge and inside the element. Our results do not depend on the particular choice we take. Okay, so we all know that uh, uh, at some point uh, we are able to uh, compute exactly the polynomial, the, uh, the stiffness contribution of the polynomial portion of the virtual element function thanks to the energy projector phi nabla, but we need to do something to stabilize uh, uh, whatever uh, lies in the kernel of the, uh, of the projector uh, operator. And the stabilizing bilinear form essentially has to scale. We all know it has to scale properly. And uh, uh, by properly, uh, I'm, I mean, that we would like uh, the uh, this uh, the constant that gives this uh, uh, the scaling has to scale it has to be uh, somehow uniformly bounded in terms of the uh, mesh diameter, and uh, we did this uh, work because we wanted to relax the assumptions that are usually considered on a mesh. Okay. So let's talk about the duality technique from, an abs from the abstract uh, viewpoint. As I said before, uh, in the non-conforming framework, the trace uh, of a virtual function on the boundary is not accessible, but we have that uh, the degrees of freedom are uh, span a space which, uh, for which we have uh, a nice if subcondition uh, in uh, with respect to the local van space. So using this uh, this thing that we have this stable duality relation between these two spaces, uh, we can build. Uh, uh, suppose that we know this, uh, we explicitly know the space uh, of the, the span by the degrees of freedom on which we can do a semi-inner product, and then by duality, we can transfer our result onto the VAM space uh, whose uh, basis functions are virtual, of course, and not known explicitly. Okay, so what are, what are the ingredients? Uh, so we need to work with a, with a pair of uh, Hilbert spaces, D and its dual, 
uh, on each of them we have a, a semi uh, a semi norm with a with a kernel that we want to characterize somehow and the corresponding projector well, what we also need to introduce are some uh, uh, subspaces uh, that contains the kernel of the semi norm and uh, uh, the corresponding dual mm, the dual of the corresponding uh, subspace w so uh, now, under some assumption, uh, we worked under the following assumptions. So we are assuming that the kernel of the seminorm is finite dimensional. We would like also uh, um, <clears throat> a Poincaré kind of inequality holding on the kernel of the uh, projector uh, of the projector operator, and then. Uh, most importantly, we need to uh, work uh, under the uh, hypothesis that a pair of insert conditions hold between uh, um, the two uh, the two subspaces W and W prime uh, W star. Sorry, it's dual. So thanks to this pair of this insert condition, we can do something very interesting. So. Uh, right away, we know that uh, these uh, subspaces uh, W and W star of the original Hilbert spaces uh, have uh, shared the same shared the same dimension, and the same hold also for the uh, for the kernel W hat and its dual. Uh, also, we can introduce uh, for this uh, uh, subspaces W and W star a pair of uh, bases that uh, uh, that enjoys a B orthogonality uh, property, and from this B orthogonality property, every uh, we right away, right away obtain that every element uh, uh, of the spaces can be written can be expanded in terms of this uh, uh, in terms of this basis functions why is uh, why is this uh, so important because uh, um, this allows us to do some uh, uh, algebraic manipulations uh, of the element of the of these dual spaces so now, assume that we have uh, uh, a symmetric uh, a matrix S, which is symmetric and positive definite, and it, it is uh, uh, inducing, uh, we can use it to induce a semi inner product on uh, uh, the space W. It's just the uh, semi inner product induced by these, uh, uh, by matrix S. And our assumption is that it has to scale as the uh, dual norm on as the dual the dual semi norm on uh, uh, the space W. How are we going to uh, transfer this information onto uh, so onto the dual space? Okay, using the uh, using matrix S somehow. We would like to. Uh, to compute the inverse of this matrix S, but this matrix S has a non-empty kernel. So, but what we know is that we can compute the, the uh, reflexive generalized inverse of such a matrix because it, uh, thanks to this pair of int subconditions, it, uh, mm, it very, it, uh, we know that this, uh, it verifies a saddle point, uh, a saddle point problem where uh, where we have matrix S and the uh, uh, projection, the projection onto uh, onto the uh, the kernel of the semi norm. Thanks to this uh, reflexive generalized inverse, we have it. It uh, essentially it uh, behaves like an inverse of matrix S. Uh, it is uh, uh, it is symmetric. It is a semi positive definite and we can use it uh, to define a semi uh, inner product inducing in turn a semi norm, which is equivalent to the dual norm. So using matrix S, we are transferring this information onto the dual space. So uh, let me wrap up for a second. We did, uh, so we had a, a pair 
of uh, uh, a pair of objects, we act on the primal space and we transfer our knowledge, the knowledge we had on the primal space onto the dual space. Now, how uh, the thing is that we, uh, uh, we are assuming that we know everything about the primal space. Now, how are we going to uh, apply this onto the uh, non-conforming then in the following way? Um, but first, let me quickly mention what are the mesh, the mesh assumptions usually introduced in this framework. The most basic one that we uh, keep for granted is that the elements are star shaped. Uh, now, a second uh, assumption is that uh, uh, the uh, distance between any two, any two vertices of a polygon of an element has to uh, be of the same scale. This is, uh, um, this is well known to be a uh, quite restrictive assumption. So one could, uh, uh, many alternatives uh, can be considered that we listed uh, two of them here, number three and number four, where we are uh, just requiring pair of adjacent edges to scale uh, in the same way. So this allows us uh, to, uh, this um, allows us to have uh, possibly infinitely many uh, edges. Secondly, we can have that the number of edges is uniformly bounded from above. Uh, our choice in our work is to use a mixture of uh, this uh, three and four alternatives, uh, alternative three and four, so that uh, every element uh, uh, satisfy a mixture of these two conditions. Now, let's make the, let's divide this into uh, several steps. Now, uh, step one, uh, we said uh, the degrees of freedom that we use for the non-conforming virtual element space are spanning a space which is, uh, uh, which is in a stable duality relation with the space of the with the local them uh, with the local them space. So uh, this is so this is going this is going to be uh, this is going to be the first step. Now uh, we do not want to uh, to work on the whole space of the boundary degrees of freedom. We because we understood that we can it is enough to work on the boundary degrees of freedom. And uh, indeed, uh, we can uh, we can introduce a proper subspace of the uh, of the whole set of the boundary degrees of freedom, which is essentially it is uh, it is the part that takes only into account uh, uh, the boundary degrees of freedom, and it is this uh, B uh, BKH uh, uh, with this uh, uh, small circle up here it only takes into account uh, this boundary contribution. And this subspace of the whole, uh, of the whole space is itself in a, uh, is itself uh, in a, uh, in a stable, uh, in a stable duality relation with uh, this, uh, with the boundaries, uh, with the boundary degrees of uh, freedom. Now, so we can just focus on these two subspaces. The nice thing is that the kernel of the uh, energy projector, which is uh, the one that we would like to characterize, is uh, uh, contained, is strictly contained in this, uh, uh, in this subspace. Uh, the subspace, which has the, same, uh, which has the same dimension as the set of the boundary degrees of freedom. Now, this in subcondition plus uh, this uh, uh, equality of dimensions uh, uh, implies uh, implies a, an if subcondition, uh, let's say a symmetric in subcondition with respect to uh, this one, where we here we would have the soup of each element d in uh, the HK circ. So uh, we have this pair of in subcondition, and now we are ready to. Uh, this, uh, to do this uh, uh, transfer of uh, information from the primal space to the dual space or so for them. 
But now, uh, so this is how uh, we are going to do this. The primal space here, it will be H1, the dual, uh, the dual space of H1 uh, on the uh, element P. And the dual space V prime will be H1. So, uh, of course, instead of H1, which is naturally considered as a primal space, here is considered as a, as a dual space. Why? Because we, uh, the, uh, the space which is explicitly known is actually the dual space, uh, the space of the boundaries degrees of freedom. So uh, since we know them explicitly, we can explicitly construct a semi-inner product that scales uh, exactly as the negative one uh, semi-inner product and by duality transfer this, uh, obtain uh, a semi-inner product that scales as the, uh, um, uh, the H1 semi-inner product. Thanks to uh, this uh, interplay between matrix S and its generalized inverse. Okay. Uh, one to the, uh, we, uh, we understood that uh, the, let's say, the hardest, uh, actually the hardest part in this, uh, in this framework uh, is uh, to, uh, to find the proper stabilization. Um, this slide here is, the main message here is that the hardest part is to, um, so we can split the we can split the uh, the contribution. We have to somehow characterize the the norm of this uh, of this boundary degrees uh, uh, of an element uh, of the boundary degrees of freedom. The uh, the uh, component that are spanned by the boundary uh, the degrees of freedom that are associated with a high order polynomial can be uh, easily characterized with a proper scaled l2 norm that we see here but we need to do something for the uh, constant uh, for the for the component of degree for the polynomial that are constant on each edge of the uh, of this element so in our, uh, in our work, we propose the different strategies to handle, uh, to handle this, uh, uh, to stabilize the lowest order, uh, the lowest order component. Now, we investigate a different, uh, di different options. Uh, first, uh, a quasi optimal uh, stabilization term. So we are uh, stabilizing the uh, component of order zero with a proper scaled, L2, uh, L2 semi-inner product. This provides us with a quasi-optimal term in the sense that when we uh, have to stabilize, we are losing a logarithm of the ratio between the uh, diameter of, a, of an element and the minimum uh, edge. So this stabilization suffers if we have uh, uh, a, very small L, a very small edge compared to the rest of the edges of the element. A second optimal stabilization that uh, uh, gives uh, an optimal, as you see, a, an optimal scaling, and this is done by using a wavelet decomposition of uh, the uh, space of the zero order polynomials. And finally, uh, one could use this uh, uh, duality in this duality technique uh, twice uh, in the sense that uh, rather than uh, working right away onto the set of the zero order polynomial one can uh, first construct uh, one can first construct uh, can work on uh, an explicitly known discrete space uh, uh, which is in stable duality relation with this uh, uh, zero order polynomial. So first discrete space by duality, we transfer the result onto the zero order polynomial and doing the duality trick once again, we are stabilizing the original, uh, the original them, uh, the original them space. So, 
Uh, finally, uh, I won't go into details of these stabilizations just because of lack of time. I would like to move to the uh, right away to the numerical experiments. So uh, from this, uh, we essentially came up with uh, five different stabilization strategies and uh, compared their performance uh, onto different set of meshes. Each of them were either uh, verifying or, uh, or not the mesh assumptions uh, that we had at the beginning. For example, we had this uh, sequence of meshes uh, with uh, hexagon where at each mesh refinement step, we were progressively collapsing uh, some, uh, some edges. So essentially here we had this ratio between the diameter and the uh, smallest edge that, were, that is uh, uh, actually exploding. Here we have uh, uh, elements where the number of edges increases at each step. So we, here we have an, uh, uh, the number of edges which is exploding and similarly here. Uh, essentially, just want to uh, move quickly to the conclusions. Here I'm reporting the most, uh, significant, uh, most significant results. These are the uh, convergence. Uh, this is the convergence with respect to the uh, to an uh, estimator of the relative uh, H1 uh, relative H1 error. What we saw is that essentially all the strategy on these meshes, actually, these are the results on the hexagonal meshes. So small collapsing edge. On this set of meshes. Uh, most stabilizations were performing in a similar way as uh, the degree was get, as the degree of the approximation was getting higher the least uh, performing stabilization was of course a stabilization that was given by the euclidean product of the uh, degrees of freedom when we tested uh, uh, when we tested the uh, we did the same for the meshes with the increasing number of edges. Also here, we saw similar, uh, similar, uh, similar performance. This is the relative error for the L2, uh, for a, an estimator of the L2 relative error, uh, besides some difference in the, uh, in the, in the constant, in the multiplicative constant for the error estimate, estimates. We, we do not see big difference besides some uh, uh, ill conditioning here as the degree is getting higher, some ill conditioning that is uh, for a, a stabilization where we were using some scaled Laplace Beltrami operator. And the last result, and I'm moving to the conclusions quickly. This is for the mesh where we had some uh, squares with many, many, many uh, edges. Again, on this set, we uh, were able to perform five stabilization strategies because we had also, uh, this was a nice mesh to handle. And also, uh, also here, we see, some di we see some difference and the best performing stabilizations were the one uh, uh, where the one we developed with this duality technique and with the wavelet decomposition and some square, some scaled, uh, square root scaled Laplace Beltrami coming from domain decomposition. Okay, uh, so uh, we essentially found in our investigation that uh, some stabilization appear more robust than others and they appear to be very promising. Uh, there are many technical details in this work that uh, anyone interested might have a look, but uh, that's it. And I would just like to thank you for your attention.